Well, um, I'm excited to share the scriptures with you. How many of you have recognized that you receive life when you read the scriptures? Uh, have you noticed that the word of God is living and active, living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword? It divides between soul and spirit, joints and marrow. Can you believe this? Out of his mouth comes a sharp two-edged sword, two-edged sword. We hear him and we see it's the scriptures that actually breathe life into us. I've said it here before, and I'll, I'll say it again. Uh, Charles Spurgeon has that great quote. Somebody asked him, uh, what's more important, worship or the word? And he said, you tell me what's more important, breathing in or breathing out. <laughs> it's, uh, it's the receiving of the word that is, is life. The scripture says that all scripture, all scripture is breathed out by God. It's all breathed out by God so that we might receive life. On the inside, Jesus says this incredible statement. He goes, my words are spirit and life. He speaks and we come alive. The scripture says there's a day coming when the dead will hear the voice of the son of God and they will rise from the dead. Everybody. It's in small measure right now, as you listen to God's voice, those dead things inside of you come to life again. In Exodus 38, chapter 38, verse 8, the scripture talks about the labor being made by the mirrors of the maidens. The mirrors of the maidens were used to make the labor. The labor is what the, the priest would wash in. Now, now, think about this for a second. If the labor is made of the maidens' mirrors, that means you can see yourself in there and also wash there. And that's what the scriptures are. You get to see the dirt on your face, and then in the same place you saw the dirt on your face, wash your face. Amen. The washing of the water with the word. And so we love the scriptures because they, they breathe life into us. I do have something I felt from the Lord this morning to share, but before I do, I was quickened while we were worshiping. How many of you felt quickened this morning? You guys, we don't use that word much. That's kind of a King James word. But it's literally enlivened, in, invigorated. You feel it, an inflow of life. Uh, spiritual animation comes upon you. How many know what I'm talking about? You know, that's grace. That's grace. Grace is not just God's unmerited favor. Grace is invigoration by the Spirit on the inside. Uh, the, the, the dead things, that your lack of desire, just... When the life of God comes and grace comes in, you're all of a sudden, you desire the Lord. It's almost like a push. When I go for bike rides with my daughter, sometimes she gets tired of um, pedaling, and she goes, Daddy, push me. And so I come from behind really fast, and I put my hand on her and I, while I'm going super fast, and I push her. And she's able to just coast for a long period of time because of my push. I think sometimes we get like this in our Christian lives. We get tired of pedaling, and we say, oh, Lord, push me. And the Lord comes behind with supernatural power and grace, and he pushes you forward, and all of a sudden you start accomplishing more on accident than you ever did on purpose. Uh, you make more progress with one push from God than all the pedaling in the world. And so we look to Christ today for mercy that gives us grace. But today I felt quickened with this verse. The scripture says in Psalm 147, verse 3, one verse I want to look at. It says this, he, God, he heals the brokenhearted and he binds up all their wounds. Now, I want to talk to you for a minute about the wording here. I looked this up. I really wanted to understand this verse and eat it. How many of you know that when you read the Bible, you're only gathering the grapes? You need to meditate in order to eat them. You know, you, you, can, you can read the Bible like a bird flies over flowers, or you can land on a flower like a bee and suck out every nectar. Uh, the difference is, if you just pass through a city, you may remember one or two things that you saw in the city, but if you set up your, your, your seat in the city square, to, in order to draw or paint what you see, you're going to look at every shadow, every face, every shape, every color, you're going to focus in on it and you'll be able to draw out the things that you see. That's the difference between reading and meditation. Reading is just passing through the city. Hopefully you remember something. Meditation is I'm sitting up, setting up in the city square and I'm looking at every shadow, every color, every shape. And so when you look at this verse, you could just read it and say, oh, the Lord binds up the broken heart and he heals up all their wounds and move on. Or you can stop 
And you can look at it and see not only what it says, but how its nectar can be received into your life so that it passes from brain to blood. It passes from something that you just know and can tell somebody to something that is actual nourishment for your being. Does that make sense to you? And so you look at this and it says, he heals the brokenhearted. The first thing that's very important to recognize is he doesn't designate this to somebody else. He does this himself. God is the one who heals the brokenhearted. He's not going to make an angel come to you and do it. He wants to do this. You know, there's certain things with uh, my wife. It's like, no, I want to be the one that does this for her. I'm not, said, I'm not giving this to anybody else. That's my love. That's my heart. And I'm going to do this for her because that's me. That's mine. You understand? God is like this with you. He's not going to designate this to something lesser than himself. He's going to take care of this himself. Praise God. He does this, and we must look to him to do it. But look at what it says here. He heals the brokenhearted. The interesting thing is there's no word for brokenhearted. Uh, the word actually is repair uh, damage. So, so okay, so repair, there's, the word damage is not in there. The, the word repair is there and heart is there. But to repair a heart means that there's damage in the heart. The, the best definition I've ever heard of the heart is from the Logos Bible software. And it says the heart is the immaterial center of your being. The immaterial center of your being from which everything flows. Everything you are is cosmetic to your heart. Jesus says out of the heart come thoughts, actions, words. The heart is the center of you. This is why God wants your heart. (laughs) Because if he gets the heart, he has you. And so God repairs the heart, which shows us that the heart can get damaged. It can get damaged. Jesus tells us this. I hate to say it's a promise. It's more of a prophecy. (laughs) When he says, in this world, you will have tribulation. You will have trials in this world. And it's by virtue of the fact that this whole place is under the power of the wicked one. The scripture says, 1 John 5, 19, the whole world lies underneath the power of the wicked one. That means sin, sickness, death, depression, darkness. That stuff is just prevalent in this world. I remember one preacher once said, right now is the closest thing that believers will ever be to hell. And right now is the closest thing unbelievers will ever see to heaven. (laughs) And so in, in this way, this whole world is under this oppression, and Jesus recognizes it. He doesn't say to us, when you get born again, you will then be sucked up out of the oppressions of this world and go into heaven. (laughs) Otherwise, it'd be a twofold ministry. It'd be an evangelist and then a sniper. (laughs) Get them saved and get them out. (laughs) No, this world is going to have these things, but the scriptures show us, though the heart can be and will be damaged by things that happen to us in this life. Everybody's got some type of, in some degree, some variation of damage that's happened in your heart just by virtue of being a human being and being in this world. Jesus is telling us, in this world, your heart is going to get damaged. But he says, he, he is the one who repairs the damage in the immaterial center of your being. He himself wants to do this. Now, this next part is incredible. It says that he binds up all their wounds. Now, the wording here is incredible. You can look this up yourself and see that it's right. But the word that's used for binding is wrap. And when, it's, when the word wrap is used, wrapping, it's connected to what the s- subject is. So the subject is him. So the wrapping is himself. It can actually be read like this, that the Lord himself, he repairs the immaterial center of your being that has been damaged in this world, and he wraps your wounds with his own person. Which shows us something. When you wrap a wound, it's you are... That let's say you have a, a, a damage on your arm and you wrap it up. It stays on there and is upon it until it completely heals. Does that make sense? It's almost like the Lord is saying, if you 
give your heart to my presence, I will wrap your heart with my presence and heal you. He himself will do this for us. And I know many of us have had different things like this, but it is so encouraging to note that this is something God takes on himself and God promises himself to do for you. The, the, the whole word compassion is incredible. I can't get over it because it means to be attracted to weakness. It means to be attracted to sorrow. It means that he's attracted to those things about you. Maybe it's a failure. Maybe it's a situation. Maybe it's a loss of some kind. He's pulled in by it. He, he's, he sees it and he comes in and now you know why he wants to come and he wants to wrap your whole being with his presence and heal you himself. That's incredible, isn't it? Yeah. That this is the kind of God that we serve and that we worship. He doesn't stay aloof in the sky saying, hey, you know, pull up your bootstraps, buddy. You can do it. Just keep going. No, he says, I'm going to come down to you. I'm going to wrap you with myself and I'm going to heal you myself. That's incredible to me. That compassion makes me want to do what Moses did when God told him that he is compassionate. He fell on his face and he worshiped. Thank you, God, for this. Doesn't that want to, doesn't that make you just make your heart melt? You say, I want to love him. You, you know, you search all other gods that people have made up. Search all other Greek gods and mythology. You won't find one who drops down out of heaven to wrap you with his presence and heal you himself. He, not sending someone else to do this bidding. He loves you and desires to be the one who heals you. Even as with Hosea, in Hosea, he says that he doesn't want to give them deliverance. He wants to be their deliverance. It's completely different. Jesus could, God could just basically say, hey, I'm going to break off a piece of deliverance and say, hey, take that and run away. You know, you're, you're, no, no, no. I want to be all of that for you, myself. That's incredible to me. That is a God that is worthy of worship and worthy of love. Does that make sense? Just do this with me and then we'll, then we'll get into the, the short word that I have. Just put your hand on your heart. And let's just say this together. Say, God, I recognize from your word that you yourself can repair my damaged heart. And that you yourself desire to wrap me, wrap my wounds with yourself and heal me. So, Lord, I come to you and I give you all the damage in my mind, in my heart, in my life, and I give myself to your presence that I'd be healed by you and not anybody else or any other thing. You yourself. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Praise God. Turn over to Revelation. I'm not going to go very long, but turn over to Revelation chapter 3. This is what I was feeling from the Lord this morning, and I'm just going to jump with it and see how it goes. As you turn there, I pulled this quote that I thought was just so amazing. It's from the old Puritan uh, Thomas Watson. He says, <clears throat> Oh, that sweet serenity which drops like honey upon the soul while it is drawing nigh to God. <laughs> Listen to it one more time. Oh, that sweet serenity, which drops like honey upon the soul while it is drawing nigh to God. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. That there is in fellowship with God a serenity, a peace, a fulfillment, a satisfaction that the world can't even come close to. It can't even be compared to things in this world because he himself is the fullest thrill there isn't a higher bliss than the enjoyment of God's presence. And I think sometimes we forget this. I think it's kind of natural to forget this. We're surrounded by this world, this life, our responsibilities, people, hurts, pains, sorrows. And we just end up constantly drifting away from the experiential bliss of who he is in fellowship with him. It just kind of happens. I'll be the first one to raise my hand and say, it's happened to me more than I want to admit 
that my heart just draws away from experiencing and living by the experience of the Lord. So Revelation chapter 3, verse 14, it says, To the angel of the church of Laodicea, write this, The amen, the faithful, the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God says this, I know your deeds. I know that you're neither cold nor hot. I wish, I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will, future, I will spit you out of my mouth because you say this, I'm rich, I've become wealthy, I have need of nothing, and you do not even know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by the fire so that you'll become rich and white garments so that you may be that you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed in eye self to anoint your eyes so that you can see those whom I love <laughs> I reprove and discipline therefore be zealous and repent I stand at the door and I'm knocking. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and I will dine with him and he with me. Oh, he who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. Isn't that incredible? But I want to point out one major point, and it is right there in verse 19. Those whom I love. Say this with me. Say, those whom I love. The issue in this letter is love. Jesus, in great love, speaks these words. He doesn't come to make, make war with them. He's not trying to push them to the ground, kick dust in their face and say, you guys, are, you guys have screwed up and I'm leaving you. In love, he comes to them and shows them what they cannot see. Yeah. In love, he invites them. It's, it's almost as if Jesus is inviting them out of indifference and into enjoyment of his person. And that he sees to be overcoming. So you say, you say, Eric, where do you get the word indifference? Well, the word Laodicea means lukewarm and can also be translated indifferent. It is a uh, not hot, not cold, in between, kind of vacillating, which is why Jesus reveals himself to them as the am, the, the I am, or the, the, the amen. You say, Eric, why would he reveal himself to them as the amen. Well, every letter to the churches, there's a situation. And each situation starts with a revelation, which shows us this. The issue can only be fixed by seeing Jesus. Whatever church situation you find, the very first thing that we're in need of is a revelation of Jesus. And whatever the problems are in the church, Jesus shows himself to be the very thing that need to be seen in order to fix the problems. You say, Eric, I, I don't understand how they cor correlate. Indifference and amen are complete opposites because the amen is certainty. He is certain. Indifferent is uncertain. It's kind of like vacillating. It's like water. Jesus is the certain amen stone. And they are watery and flipping around and just, ah, I don't know. And so Jesus says, look at me. I'm the amen. If you see him as the solid, unchanging, amen rock, the so be it of God, it changes the way that you respond to him. Yeah. Not only this, but he reveals himself as the faithful and true witness, which is a witness means not only has he experienced God as a man, he experienced God as a man, and he lives out his life perfectly in this world, which is incredible, but he is faithful to God, which is the complete opposite of indifference. Right. Indifference is, un, is, is not even considering whether or not you're faithful. You're just kind of like in between. Faithfulness is the complete opposite of indifference. And Jesus is revealing himself to them. This is what I am. And if you can see me as that, 
then it will change the way that you see things. But let's move on here because this is very, it gets very interesting. He says, I know your deeds. You notice he says this to every church. And now remember, when he says, I know your deeds, he's not just saying, I know what you do with your hands. I know what your life is like. As a matter of fact, in the chapter before, he actually defines it like this. He says, I am he who searches the hearts and the minds to give to each one according to their deeds. In other words, when he says, I know your deeds, he says, I know every thought that's in your brain. I know every intention and motive in your heart. I see you x-rayed. I see you fully. That's what he's saying. And with this, he says, you're indifferent. I see your mind. I see your heart. I see your whole soul disposition, and you're indifferent towards me. You say, Eric, what does the word indifferent mean? Well, I, I looked it up so I can get a real good definition of it. And it is to, where is it here? Lack, concern, or real interest. Now listen to this. Lack, concern, or real interest interest. Jesus is saying, I'm looking at you. I can see your heart and I can see your mind. And I see that you really are not concerned about yourself, about your relationship with me. You're really not concerned about it. And not only this, but you have a lack of interest in me, he's saying. And so I see you and this is the condition. Now look at this. It gets pretty incredible right here. He says, because you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Now the tense of that spitting is future, which means he's giving them an opportunity right now to change things. He's saying where you're headed, indifference, the end of the road of indifference is not good, Jesus is saying. So he's saying I'm giving you a time to rescue you from this coming day when you will be removed because of your indifference. Are you following me? This is, so when we read this, I'll spit you from my mouth, sometimes we're like, oh man, that's kind of harsh. No, 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 it's wonderful mercy that he would let you know that this is where you're headed. Does that make sense? So we, we shouldn't look at Jesus as mad at them. He's actually in love with them. And he's trying to, as he says, uh, discipline and reprove, which means he wants to direct them away from going in the bad way. Just like you would with your kids. You see your kids hanging out with some guy that's just not good, you know, and you tell them that you should, you should stay away. Bad company corrupts good morals. You should stay away from that person. Why? Because you know where the end of that goes. And in love, you reach out and you say, let me help direct you and guide you. And then if they don't listen to you, then you have to discipline and say, I'm separating you from that person for your good. And this is what God is doing. This is the love of Jesus. Don't go that way. Don't go indifference. And if you keep going, I'm going to have to discipline you out of that to save you. It's the Savior speaking here. Now, this is crazy. When he talks about this indifference, remember what we des described indifference as. It is, it is a lack of interest and concern for your relationship with the Lord, for your spiritual state, your spiritual well-being. Look at these three things that he says, which are incredible. He says to them that they are, they, they say, I am rich, I've become wealthy, and I have need of nothing. So three things here that he points out as indifference. So if you want a Jesus definition of indifference, it's these three things. One, I am. They're self-conscious. Two, I have become wealthy. That's self-confidence. And then three, I have need of nothing. That's self-sufficiency. Are you seeing these three things right there? Jesus is revealing the reason why they're blind, what their indifference looks like, it is their self-conscious life, their self-confident life, and their self-sufficiency in life. It's the opposite of dependence on God. It's I got this. Let me just say that the remedy here that Jesus points to is letting him in in fellowship. One of the greatest ways you can declare to God that you do not need him is by living a life that doesn't come to him. One of the ways that we on the earth send a message up to God that he's not very valuable to us and we've got this in and of ourselves is to live a life that does not open the door and sit at the table with him. We may never say it with our mouths, but with our lives, we can testify to God that you don't, I don't need you. Lack of prayer 
Lack of time with God is a declaration to God, I do not need you. Prayer is a declaration to God, oh, I am greatly in need of you. Are you seeing me? You seeing what I'm saying? So he says this, written miserable. So, so Jesus says this. He says that they are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. So the self-conscious life, the self-confident life, this self-sufficient life that they are completely unaware of, that Jesus is trying to open their eyes to, is that they are useless. That's what the word wretched means, is useless. Miserable, they're joyless. Oh, we miss a thousand joys by neglect of communion with God. He calls them poor. They're bankrupt. They have nothing to give to the world or to anyone else or to even to God. They're blind. They're sightless. They can't see the world to come. They can't even see where God's leading in them in their lives. They're just blind. And they're naked. They're carrying shame with them. Why? Because they don't have these things that come from the Lord. So Jesus actually advises them to buy from him. This is a wonderful word because it means actually to acquire from him. Let me, in other words, get this from me. There's no other place to get this. Get what? Gold. <laughs> Gold, which is real riches. Things that are very valuable in this, in, in the spiritual life. Valuable where it doesn't end. Physical gold will melt away and be gone, as, as Peter tells us. It's more, the blood of Jesus is more precious than silver or gold. And so we see here, Jesus says, come inquire from me, receive from me gold refined in the fire. This is true riches. And he wants them to receive this, these clothes that are white. Praise God. Clean clothes and eye salve so that they can see. The word here that's used for zealous is incredible to me. And it is really the heart of what Jesus is wanting from them. Because he says, be zealous. And the word zealous actually means a high admiration and warm feeling for. Isn't that incredible? We always fight against feelings, but Jesus wants you to have affections for him. <laughs> it, to, <laughs> to live a life that doesn't have affections for Jesus, Jesus is not getting what he wants from us. Right. He wants love from you. He wants your heart love. He wants you to be able to actually say with your heart, oh, how I love you. Like David says, I love the Lord. To what God even desires in the Old Testament, the very first thing he asks of them is to love me with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. So we see Jesus is saying here, be zealous and repent, turn back to me. And then this is the way that you turn back to him. This is what he's asking them to turn back. You guys know the word repent, right? It is literally about face. It's turn, it's you were this way, and you turned this way. And now Jesus tells them how they need to turn from this way to this way. He says, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him. So repentance is open the door of fellowship again. Indifference is separation from his presence. Because Jesus is on the outside, not on the inside. Does that make sense? With them, the imagery is what I'm using. That he's, out, he's on the outside and they're indifferent. So he says, break the indifference by opening the door and let's dine together. Good. Let's sit together. Um, this communion with him is, is interesting because it's used as a table. It's dining, it's eating, it's receiving life from him. It is receiving nourishment from him. Let me ask you a question. Why do you knock on somebody's door? Is it not to get their attention? <laughs> and not only to get their attention, if you're knocking on their door, you want them to let you in. There's two things that you're looking for if you knock on a door. And that's what Jesus is doing in the letter. He's trying to get their attention and he wants them to respond by opening up the door. Yielding. This is the repentance Jesus is looking for from this indifferent people. Come in, let me in so that we can dine together and, and enjoy each other. I'll say one last thing and then uh, I'll give a kind of a call for all of us just to look at our lives and see if indifference has in some way crept in. Eric, how do I know if indifference has crept in? Well, you find yourself extremely self-conscious. Everything's about you. 
How do you know? How do I know if I've become indifferent? Well, you're very self-confident, which means you don't look to the Lord for everything. It's not in everything by prayer in your life. Or uh, how do I know if I've become indifferent? Well, self-sufficiency. You feel that there is really no need to look to the Lord. There is lack of thanksgiving. Paul tells us to, to, to do everything in the name of the Lord, giving thanks to the Father through him. It's, that means thanksgiving should be in every, every area of our life. Every room of our house should be bathed in thanksgiving. Every meal, every, every car drive, everything that we do should be bathed in thanksgiving. It should be constantly going up. You know, when gratitude is lacking, bad attitudes are there. <laughs> you can really see where your bad attitude comes from. It's a lack of gratitude. <laughs> And so when we forget that we deserve nothing and that God has been good to us, then what happens is we become ungrateful and gratitude is lacking. And this is a sign of self-sufficiency. This is a sign of indifference. Being ungrateful is indifference. So what he's asking them to do is open the door and dine with him. When we dine with him. Let me just give you a quick little picture, and then, then we'll, we'll move on here to, to a call for all of us just to kind of open our hearts before the Lord. You see, the Lord sent me here for a reason. Yeah. And it's, it's very simple. I'm not trying to lay hands on everybody, have everybody fall down on the ground and shake. This is what God is after. He wants to find out where in our hearts his name has become tasteless. He, just, he wants to look around and he says, let me deal with these things that are on the inside and revive them. Let me breathe on the embers. Let me put grace again in your heart so that you desire the scriptures. Yeah. And not that you're trying to get your, your, your word in. I need to get my word in. No, no. You desire to eat at the table of the Lord. <laughs> and, and Thanksgiving is erupting from your heart, not because you set a timer on your watch to make sure you, thanks, you give thanks to God every seven minutes. No, no, it's because it's coming from your heart, because grace has come in, because you opened the door, and the wind of God's grace came in with the man, Christ Jesus, and you sat with him, and you ate nourishment that gave you these new qualities, which is thanksgiving, and praise, and adoration, and worship, and desire for prayer, a, a spirit of supplication, a longing for his word, love for people, even people that you don't even really like. The spirit comes upon you and enables you to be different with them and actually see them different. Does that make sense to you? That's what happens when you eat at this table. So let me just show you what it looks like to eat at the table. When you sit down to eat, you probably have a drink there. You probably have some food there. You probably have some utensils there, right? And what you do is you, you take a minute and you, you, you begin to cut the food up, right? You put it in your mouth. You chew on it for a little bit. You swallow it. Then you take a drink, put the drink down, maybe cut it some more up. Chew it a little bit, and then take another drink. It's very similar. While you're sitting there eating, this is very similar to what Jesus is looking for in communion with him. He wants you to sit down with him. This is not running around. This is taking deliberate time to sit with the Lord, not moving, just sit. And then take this book and start to read it. That's cutting the meat. And then when, once you've cut that meat and put it in your mouth by reading the scriptures, then you chew on it. You meditate on it. And you, by prayer, you ask the Lord to make you one with that thing. That's swallowing the food. And then maybe you need a drink after that and you just begin to worship the Lord. Lord, I worship you. I praise you. So you're mixing these things together all in the table of the Lord. I'm reading the scriptures. I'm meditating upon the scriptures. I'm praying the scriptures and I'm worshiping in the midst of the scriptures. And you find the three golden pipes through which the golden oil flows. And this is the table of the Lord of communion with him where you're sitting and eating and swallowing and enjoying and drinking. And that's what he's looking for you to open the door in your life to so that you can have that reality of nutrients that give you what is necessary to walk out his nature. Are you following me? I'm excited about these things because I know in my life, if I neglect the table of the Lord, indifference is the very first thing that starts happening. Self-confidence comes in. Self-consciousness takes over. Self-sufficiency comes in. Lack of thanksgiving comes in. Lack of desire for his word. Lack of longing for worship. Lack of real praise. 
But God wants to invite each one of us today because he loves us. And with the word, we look into the, the laver made with the maiden's mirrors and we see those spots on our faces where we have neglected God, where indifference has, has crept in. And we take that reproof and we take that discipline from the Lord by the scriptures and we take that water and we put it to our faces and we wash off this stuff that we've seen about ourselves in the Bible with the Bible. Does that make sense? Man, praise God. I love this. Makes me so happy. So I wonder who will be honest enough today to actually say, Eric, my desire for the word of God has been absolutely suffering. I wonder if somebody would be honest enough to say, when I think about reading the Bible, it's very similar to thinking about chewing on an old rope. Maybe you think about prayer. And you're just at the point in your life where your faith is so uh, attacked that you're like, what is, what's the use? What's the use of prayer? Maybe worship used to, the thought of worship used to make your heart erupt. And now you sing the songs and you don't even remember the words that you're, you're saying. As a matter of fact, while you're saying the words, you don't even think about the words that you're saying. And it's literally like you're just making sounds. You say, Eric, what are you you trying to say? I'm trying to describe the human condition that happens when we don't open that door and sit at his table. And and this isn't a pointing a finger at you saying, you know, oh, look at you, you're, you you know, you're really bad. We all have this problem. If the table of the Lord be neglected, that's why his love comes and says, I stand at the door and I knock. If you can hear me, Open the door and I'll come in and I'll dine with you and you with me and you'll receive the grace that you need in life. I think I told this story in here before. This will be the last thing I, I say and we'll pray. I, I, I think I told this here, but I'm going to say it anyways. This older man of God came up to me one time when I was done preaching. He's a retired pastor. He's in his 90s. And he says to me, son, you did such a good job today preaching. I said, well, thank you, sir. And he says to me, when I was your age, I did the same thing. I preached. I love to read the word of God. I love to pray. I love to worship. I love to preach. And he's like, you know what that is? I said, what? He says, grace. He goes, you're nothing special, son. He says, grace is special. And I loved that he said that to me. It takes all the pressure and all the weight off. You can just throw yourself on the wind of God's grace and he'll lift you. You can just lay, you can lay down in the river of his grace and his grace will take you. You can stop pedaling and let him push you by grace if we'll just simply come to him and allow him to do this in our hearts. Stand to your feet with me. Now, it's up to you whether or not you open the door of your heart. And I, I, I guarantee you, if you choose to open the door of your heart, You are allowing the creator of the universe, the ruler of the world, the sovereign God to work in your heart. But if you choose not to sincerely and honestly open up your heart, you miss an opportunity of dealing with things that God wants to work on in your life. Does that make sense to you? So let's all just choose by logic. It's plainly logically better to just be honest with God. And open up our hearts. This isn't saying, let's go jump over a bunch of hurdles. Let's go run another marathon. It's simply, Lord, I open the door. I can't even change myself. I can't make myself love your word. I need your help, God. I I, I need you. Save me from an unwilling will. Save me, God. So just do this with me. Just put your hand on your heart. Let's do this with sincerity. Say, God, here I am. I open my heart to you. And I'm asking you to come in. Dine with me. Sup with me. Save me from an unwilling will. From cold affections. From lack of desire. Lack of concern. Save me. I, I welcome you. Come save me from indifference toward your word, toward your presence, toward worship. 
towards love in your precious name. I look to you to do this work. In Jesus' name.